Thank you very much. Very good. I'll also be joined by my colleague Saurabh Gupta, who's our president of research uh, as well. Thank you. So we're going to talk a little bit about the topic of the year, or well, the topic since November of 2022, uh, the impact of Gen AI. And then we're going to get into how it's going to impact the services industry, the IT industry, and also a little bit around India as well, and how we, we think India as a talent bed for tech and business contacts can, can not just survive, but thrive in this, this era. Let's start off with some bigger thinking. Hey, it's Ryan Reynolds, owner of Mint Mobile. Uh, you know, we're always looking for ways to save you money. So this year, we're kicking things off with an ad that I created using ChatGPT, the AI technology. This is what I asked it to write. I, I, said, I said, write a commercial for Mint Mobile in the voice of Ryan Reynolds. Use a joke, a curse word, and let people know that Mint's holiday promo is still going, even after the big wireless companies have ended theirs. This is what it wrote. Hey, it's Ryan Reynolds here. First of all, let me just say Mint Mobile is the shit. But here's the thing. All the big wireless companies out there are ending their holiday promos, but not Mint Mobile. We're keeping the party going because we're just that damn good. Give Mint Mobile a try. And hey, as an added bonus, if you sign up now, you'll get to hear my voice every time you call customer service. Just kidding, that's, that's not really a thing. And stay classy, everyone. That is mildly terrifying, but compelling. Who doesn't love a bit of Ryan? So who here has a paid subscription to ChatGPT? A few of you. Yeah, yeah. How much is it a month in India? Twenty dollars. <laughs> yeah. Good. All right. So we talk a lot about disruption, and. Um, you know, it's a radical change to an existing industry or market due to technology innovation. So if you think about it, I've simplified it with the help of DALI um, to five really seismic disruptions that we've seen uh, hitting mankind, uh, which we uh, impacted on industry. So we invented the wheel that got us moving. Uh, we invented the steam engine, which was the next really big technological innovation, because that gave us power to move, it gave us the steam engine, it gave us windmills, the ability to uh, make flour, all these types of things, um, to drive factories. And then eventually electricity gave us light. Um, and then the light bulb was almost like uh, the Gen AI of the day, because that really recreated the use of electricity to eventually give us the internet with the use of obviously microchips and telecom infrastructure. The internet gave us data. Data is the core of everything that we do today in our consumer and our business lives. Um, but now here's the next technology innovation, um, Gen AI, because Gen AI creates content. And this is really what this is all about, right? How do we create new content to make us slicker, smarter, faster, more productive, more predictive and more personalized with everything that we do. So we, uh, we spoke with 104 leaders of Gen AI initiatives. These are 104 leaders within large global enterprises who are rolling these out and we asked them how seismic, how big is the impact of Gen AI uh, and, it's gonna, and, and its impact that you think it's gonna have on your enterprise in 2025. And you can see here they think it's gonna be bigger then the internet itself, bigger than the iPhone, the steam engine, um, and even the, uh, the Blackberry, remember that. It's gonna have a very big impact. And you know, one of the things I'm really seeing as you start to talk to many enterprises who are working with tech firms and service partners is we're, we're gonna start to see some pretty uh, impressive um, rollouts of solutions that are going to occur over the next three to six months, and you're going to see a steamroller impact of, of Gen AI in the enterprise. Um, I was just talking with a major healthcare organization yesterday who is running uh, large language models against their um, application testing, and they're already seeing a 15% improvement in cost and a big increase in speed just running LLMs against their testing processes. 
look at the speed of adoption as well. Like, I think we're already up to about 170 million users of ChatGPT, but we hit a million in two months. Netflix took them 18 years to hit a million users. So the speed of adoption of this technology is incredible. And then something called Threads apparently hit 100 million in five days, but I think we've already forgotten what that is, right? So it's not another fad. It, uh, enterprises are very serious about the potential impact of Gen AI. And here's a study that's still in the field. I managed to get Saurabh to pull off the data as it now stands. And we're seeing this year, 15% increase in technology budget is going on Gen AI. So a lot of the spend is being pushed into this area. And the question here is, who's going to benefit from that spend? Who can, who can partner with enterprises to be part of this journey? And in terms of um, increases in uh, investments in Gen AI, these are projected to, projected to increase by 30% uh, over the next 12 months. So this is happening now. We're in the calm before the storm. You know, we spent a lot of last year really trying to figure this out. And now it's really starting to get serious in, in the market. So we saw this shift from 3.5 to 4. So in, tw in, the tw in November of 2022, we saw 3.5 come out, uh, which was the first time we could use it as non-technical people. We could go in and rub, run searches, anything up to 2021 on the internet. Um, but then this big shift to um, GPT-4 over the course of last year has made a big difference with 10% of information synthesis power increase code writing is significantly improved. I just told you about what's happening in like application testing and quality assurance. That area is being hit very hard immediately by the ability to just test apps on a multiple massive basis. That's going to have quite a seismic impact on Indian IT services. When we look at the ability to respond to emotions expressed in text, that is happening quite fast. You know, just somebody who's working through ChatGPT the premium version already, you can just ask it to do things. Ask it to do things with emotion, it understands you. Um, it understands um, and its ability to pr complex process complex uh, language tools. Um, it can understand um, text generation, dialogue systems, and it can detect dialects. It can detect accents. It can detect different semantics. I was hearing that um, people are running tests around rural India and because you're building out the big um, India LLM so you can understand all the different texts and dialects across many of the India states and, and townships, villages, etc. Um, the ability to cite sources is absolutely critical and if you work with the education sector this is the biggest issue impacting them is how do we assure accuracy of what we're reading, what we're consuming, how do we avoid plagiarism, these types of issues, how do we solve complex mathematical problems like astronomy or biology and chemistry? Um, you talk to students, particularly on those covering the sciences, they're doing everything in language models at this point in time because everything they need is, is pre-2021, which is where the information is contained up to to get the information they need. And it's much more creative and collaborative. You saw Ryan Reynolds earlier being able to make jokes um, but you're able to collaborate with other people, you're being able to um, have more technical writing tasks, create marketing copy. Um, I was just talking with a couple of companies just yesterday about providing services which allow you to manage your own brands, your own logos, and your own direct marketing directly through these tools. This has a massive impact on the ability to learn writing styles, put out uh, copy, put out design, all these types of things. And then the thing that I think is really interesting, everyone is asking me all the time about the metaverse, what's going to happen with the metaverse with um, large language models and Gen AI? The optical capabilities of Gen AI are incredible. Um, and this is where the metaverse is going to come to life when it's embedded uh, within language models within probabilistic solutions and these types of things. And here's a gentleman I met last year who's going to tell us a little about what he's doing with. Last time we gave ChatGPT eyes, and this time we're going to let it use mine. 
Let's hook up GPT-4 to an eye tracker and give it access to what I'm looking at on my computer. Do you know where this is? Yes, the landmark detected is the Golden Gate Bridge, which is located in San Francisco, California. What about this building? What's its history? The Legion of Honor is a fine arts museum located in San Francisco, California. This demo uses GPT-4, eye tracking hardware, and feeds what I'm looking at into Azure's computer vision services to generate the appropriate metadata. People have mostly been talking to ChatGPT like a separate person or an assistant, but this prototype acts more like an extension of your internal thoughts. Where is this and what's its history? The Palace of Fine Arts is located in San Francisco, California. It was originally constructed for the 1915 Panama Pacific Exposition, an event- To me, AI's potential is not just in how it can act convincingly like a human, but how it could eventually act as an extension to ourselves. There you go. See, this is the ability to take what you're seeing visually, hooking it up to your own technology to get an interactive experience uh, without having to absorb yourself into an artificial environment. You're probably seeing um, the success of Apple Vision Pro because people can wear these and you can see properly wearing these and you, you, might, be, you might have seen people sitting on the subway playing music, things like that, right? All these funny videos. But we're getting to that point now where this is all becoming very real. You know, the, while there was a lot of hype around Metaverse last year with um, you know, the push around the MetaQuest, um, you know, the push from Meta with let's go and watch Netflix on virtual reality, that's all shifting to something very real, which is where this is getting interesting. So we're really looking at this journey from um, what was originally, I think, foundational AI, which was looking at you know, the original abilities to use machine learning, for example, to pull video, to pull objects, to pull, um, you know, text and data together and, and have, a, have a learning ability within systems to where we are today, which we're calling, obviously, Gen AI, the generative AI era, which is about how do we produce data at scale to create incredible content? You know, it's being used widely in the medical fields, it's being used um, in supply chains, obviously customer services, marketing. This is the middle phase of where we're going to eventually, which we're terming as purposeful AI. The purpose of AI is business leaders, human beings, we need to set the boundaries for what is responsible, what can we trust, and what do we want AI to do. And ultimately, this is about how do we create AI that's far more independent. Right? So how do we take us humans out of these workflow loops, these process loops, and become the orchestrator of these loops and workflows to create actions? How do we get away from islands of applications? How do we get away from the, um, the constricting nature of code that's holding us ransom and building out much more exciting models? We're also seeing the coming together of software and hardware to create actions. We're gonna see the introduction of robotics into um, AI software, AI technology and capabilities, so we can have much more purposeful actions driven uh, for many different enterprises. And that's where we're really headed. What is the purpose? How do we set the purpose? And then what do we want AI to do? Because you saw all the disruptions that we've looked at since the beginning of time have been driven by human beings. We created the wheel, we created steam, we created electricity, we're creating AI. We're in control of this thing. And we're seeing governments come together. Um, they're getting this regulated. They're really trying to understand what is real, what is not real, what are the boundaries that are effective and what are not effective. So let's look a bit more at some exciting things happening in the shift, maybe not just from large language models, but to large action models. Get back to the. Can you play the video here? Just press play on the video. Thank you. This is the Rabbit R1. The R1 is a fully standalone device, primarily driven by natural language. R1 is our companion that hosts the large action model. What's the nature of the reality? 
the nature of reality is a topic that has captivated the minds of philosophers and thinkers throughout history. I can use it for a wide range of tasks. Ask anything, direct actions, complex actions. For your trip, I found various flight options, a range of hotels to choose from, and car rentals available. So it's all been planned out. I just confirm, 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 and that's it. AI enhanced video calls, note taker, translator, with a rabbit eye, computer vision, and experimental teach mode. With LAN fast evolving, my R1 will eventually help me to do things that can never be achieved on an app-based phone. Thank you. Who hasn't heard of this guy, Rabbit? Jesse Liu? You all know who he is? Okay. Let's cue the next one. For example, if I want to plan a trip to London, I can just describe what I wish in full to R1. Can you plan the entire trip for me? We like cheap non-stop flights, grouped seats, a cool SUV, and a nice hotel that has Wi-Fi. Exploring ticketing options to make your trip a reality. For your trip, I found various flight options, a range of hotels to choose from, and car rentals available. I have prepared a detailed travel plan for your trip. Please take a look at it and let me know what you think. There we go. So we've seen the travel example many times, um, but the ability to move away from having to go into many different applications and just ask your devices, what I want, how do I get there? And then finally. The handheld pocket AI companion, the Rabbit R1. And it's iconic. We're working with all the best language models. That's how Rabbit OS works. There's one scenario I use the vision to look at the Discord, because Rabbit now, in the past three days, we have 5,000 members. I'm the customer service guy there. I start getting lost because the message is too much. I was on a Zoom call with some other guy. I literally just point the camera. After four or five seconds, it gives me the report. Which you would normally, you might have a college-educated person who you say, right. summarize what's happening in the customer support line exactly. for me every day. Or you might point an LLM at it and have it do a report. This is getting way beyond maybe Zoom companion to this thing is a companion. You just point it. It listens, it summarizes, it does what you need. It's half the size of your iPhone or your Android device. But uh, what does this tell you? You're probably not going to need this little orange rabbit thing in the future. This is going to be your connected device, right? And um, you know whether this is a total success or not, maybe not. Maybe these guys, these guys are the first movers. Sometimes it's the second movers who win. But the concept of where this is shifting is fascinating because, you know, Nardello himself, the Microsoft CEO, he felt the launch of the Rabbit, which is going to be available in a few weeks now, um, is as big as the launch of the iPhone by Steve Jobs, the most impressive launch since 2007. Um, when we think about it, the real innovations start with the consumer and they bleed into the, the enterprise. But if the consumer can start to get away from being constricted by islands of applications and request actions, not just request concepts and content, but actually request actions to be delivered, this is a very big deal for the enterprise eventually. We think about, you know, we use RPA to paper over cracks in systems. You know, we use uh, integration software. We're constantly trying to make our code work effectively our apps work together effectively. But are we really looking at a future of more and more apps, or are we looking at a future of maybe no apps? Because large language models understand what we're saying, but large action models, like what you're seeing with the R1, these actually get things done. And these can make it possible for AI systems to see and act on apps in the same way that humans do. This is what's very interesting. And they learn through demonstration, you know, watching a person using an interface in order to replicate the process, right? These lambs can learn the interfaces from any software, right? We're not being held ransom by software anymore. So they solve a problem of islands of apps um, that would otherwise uh, be fully integrated. So this could be the end of the app, the app store, but it could be, maybe, could be far far more than just that. 
So I think the safe way to look at this is we talk about an S-curve of true disruption. What we're seeing right now, we look back over the first 25 years of the services industry, which uh, India has become uh, very prominent for providing pools of talent at scale. We can see all the different um, improvements and augmentations of the linear model developing services. You know, we, we use offshore, we use nearshore, we use the discipline and robustness of Lean and Six Sigma, um, technology augmentation, all the discipline and focus around DevOps, shoring anywhere. All this led to maybe productivity increases of maybe 30%, um, fairly stable growth, fairly linear growth, usually based on a combination of people with some technology, some process discipline, but ultimately it's running the same old things the same way, just a little bit faster, a little bit more mature with some better workflow. This is where we're starting to see the hockey stick play in. You know, we're starting to see applications like, you know, um, intelligent document processing, which have allowed companies in the healthcare, insurance, banking sectors, for example, to haul their systems out of the dark ages. We saw a lot of process mining going on, which enables companies to run their big ERP systems more effectively. Then the advent of machine learning, Gen AI, and beyond. You know, this is, this is the S-curve. You know, we're seeing possible impacts of around 70%, even bigger than that, in value as we start to look at the business cases of what's happening. But if you can run large language models to test all your apps, that's a huge amount of saving and value straight away. If you can run them to understand customer operations more effectively, if you're getting the same questions over and over again uh, from your customers, this can eventually break out of these old customer constrained models. Uh, we're just at the cusp of many things happening, and we have to be ahead of this to be truly effective. Now I'm going to ask my colleague Saurabh to come up, um, who's going to give us some context around how this is going to really impact India and the services industry. All right. I'm happy with this. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Oh, we yes. have a voice. All right. Great. So, so let's let's look at what Phil was talking to us about and, and see what what is the implication of this on the on the Indian IT uh, business services. Uh, I think the first thing that I would suggest in this sort of overflowing room uh, is let's not just be so focused on only productivity. I think if we have to succeed in that new S curve, yes, productivity will be a part of the conversation, but it has to be more than productivity. And I think there are a few reasons. One, sort of the moment we focus on productivity, it starts to become a defensive and a negative conversation, right? You, uh, and we were reaching out to these enterprises and we've so far got responses from about 275 enterprises. And you can see, you know, the first time that if, if your AI, if your AI narrative is so focused on productivity, it starts to lead into employee discontent. What's in it for me? Am I going to lose my job? You know, do, do you want that to be your AI narrative? It starts to get into stakeholder resistance, right? Will I be on another chatbot if, if I'm dealing with an airline? My chatbot experience is so poor, you know, and it's, it starts to become, because it's, it's sort of looked at it as a productivity angle, and I think that's, that's not helpful, you know, it, and it's, it's short-sighted. You know, productivity will give you a little bit of operational benefits, maybe a little bit of operational reduction, but in the bigger scheme of things, every enterprise today is looking for growth. Uh, and AI can actually help you drive growth, help you drive top line, not just operational cost reduction. So I, I think that's the one thing that our IT industry needs to grow in terms of, yes, productivity. You know, think of it like payroll, right? How many of you call your payroll department when you get a pay slip? I don't, but I'm asking. Nobody, right? It's sort of that. You know, you only call your payroll if you don't get a pay slip, right? Uh, and, and I think that's where we are. Uh, everybody assumes that you'll be able to drive cost savings, you'll be able to drive productivity. But there's no kudos for that. And I think we need to move beyond that. I think this has been a tough year. 2023 was a tough year. If you look at the major players uh, here, India Heritage, and even global players, 
look look at the downward trend. Uh, and if you look at uh, the market forecasts uh, and the predicted forecast for 2024, it's not going to be that rosy. It's going to be low to single digit growth. Now we can be we can be happy with that and continue to sing the India Rara story, or look at what's the opportunity there. How do we get the hockey stick that we've been so used to over the last 20, 30 years in India? How do we get there? And I think there is demand. So if we continue, and this is again a group of 500 odd uh, global 2000 enterprises, if we continue to define our industry in the way that we've defined it, uh, you know, here are my IT services, here are my business services, here's cloud migration, here's this, here's that, I think we're looking to five to six percent growth. However, if we can redefine our industry and talk about uh, Gen AI, and if we talk about AI and talk about, you know, I'll talk about the quad factor of ADA uh, in a bit, uh, there is potential to grow by 10, 12 percent, but it, it needs to redef we need to redefine our industry a little bit. And you can see that 9% growth, that 10% growth is going to be driven by AI machine learning, AI uh, gen AI, it's going to be driven by automation, it's going to be driven by analytics, it's going to be driven by data platforms. Nobody is, you know, cloud migration is an old story. <laughs> let's, let's get beyond that. How do you do cloud migration to drive business outcomes is the new story. The other big thing that I feel the Indian IT industry has to do is develop some more business acumen. Let's not just sell to the CIO. You know, the CIO only accounts for 50% of the spend. The rest of that 50% of the technology spending is outside the CIO's office. Why do we only sell to CIOs? How many CFOs are there at the NASCOM conference? I don't know if there's anybody from NASCOM. They have the answer. I haven't seen any. Yeah, uh, but, but very few, right? Because our industry, by name, is called the IT industry. And I think that needs to change a little bit, because then you're addressing 50% of the potential spent out there. Look at this, right? So we basically plotted all the emerging technologies that we could think of and asked people how much are they going to grow spend and how much are they uh, uh, drive adoption. And basically, is this quad factor of automation, analytics, AI, and data platforms. That's it. Everything else is either getting commoditized or it's too small in terms of adoption to be able to get us that back to that hockey stick uh, growth that we, we all aspire to. I think the other big thing is, you know, we've, we've talked about labor arbitrage for the last 30 years, 40 years. But I think it's time for the Indian IT industry to talk about technology arbitrage. You know, if you look at the average CIO uh, in the industry, he or she knows how to deal with a SAP, an Oracle. He or she knows how to deal with a hyperscaler, you know, Microsoft Azure or uh, AWS or GCP. How many uh, CIOs knows how to strike a partnership with a hugging face? How many CIOs? can track all the hundreds and millions of startups that are coming up in China, in Bangalore, in uh, Silicon Valley. How do they keep track of that? But shouldn't this be our responsibility in the IT industry to get to go to these CIOs and say, look, this is a ready-made ecosystem for your supply chain transformation or for what have you. We've built it. If we can't keep track of it, what's the chance that the CIO has for this? And I think the scale of your technology partnerships is going to differentiate you more than the scale of your the number of people that you have in your delivery centers. And I think that's that technology arbitrage is equal to ecosystem orchestration. And I think we need to revisit our solutions around that. Again, the point around productivity should not be lost, right? So Phil was talking about the 100 odd enterprises that we were able to talk to who are doing real Gen AI work. And if you start to cluster those 100 use cases, yes, productivity is a part of it, but there is personalization, there is mass personalization that you can do with this technology. There is huge amount of predictive capabilities that you can do with this technology. So why do you only sell productivity is the question. You know, there's some great examples, right? There is a facial skin analysis that you can do with this. You know, you look at your app or uh, a website, it scans your face and then starts to recommend this is your facial skin cleansing routine. You know, here are the products. Uh, I, I, I was talking to another, uh, another pet foods manufacturer who's 
who's going to recommend you diets for your cats and dogs based on x-ray scans, based on the vet reports, et cetera. Now imagine how could they do that, you know, uh, in the past is by hiring hundreds and thousands of doctors in maybe Philippines. It's just not a scalable model if you've got two million consumers. But this can do mass personalization at a fraction of the cost, which will drive their uh, top line, not just drive productivity. And last but not the least, I think we need to start looking at how do we train our people. You know, we've been very, very happy by training people on the latest languages. You know, uh, earlier it was Java, then it was Python, now it's something else. But actually, if you talk to the clients, what they want is people with problem-solving skills. What they want is people who can, who, can, who can give them structured thinking. You know, technology is there. Uh, that's becoming you know, almost too easy to use, uh, that even a person like me and Phil can create like fancy charts now, right? Uh, without having to deal with a lot of uh, 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 people to, to drive it. But, but I think these things are not being, our people are not being trained on these skills, either in universities or in enterprises. And I think that's, a, that's something that we have to do. And then lastly, I think we need, to, we need to have a very mature conversation around generative AI because this is not a slam dunk. Uh, you know, uh, there, are, there is an arms race to foundational model. You should look at the amount of PE capital that's flowing into uh, Gen AI. The valuations are through the roof. They are at 100x PSR ratios or um, uh, market cap to revenue ratios. And I think there's a bubble being formed here. I don't know when that bubble will burst, but at some point it will. And when that bubble bursts, the technology will be blamed. So beware of that. Uh, beware of more power getting concentrated with the hyperscalers. You should go to your clients and talk about that. Are you comfortable getting even more power to Google and Microsoft and uh, Amazon? How do we democratize this? You know, all the Gen AI power is going to those three. Uh, a brand new ecosystem that I was talking about is being formed. The average consumer, uh, your average client, doesn't know what that is. You know. That's a huge opportunity for you to go and talk to them about this is the ecosystem, this is how you engage with that ecosystem, this is how you price that ecosystem. Obviously, data privacy laws, I think there'll be huge amounts of conversation in this whole uh, uh, two days around data privacy, security, uh, AI ethics, responsible AI, et cetera, so I won't uh, take too much time there. Uh, but you know, the, the other big question will be how, how do you get your clients to share their private data, you know, data coming from their ERPs. Right now, most of our Gen AI initiatives are based on publicly available data. And that's going to be a big, big theme. And, and technology is evolving. You know, Phil was talking about large action models. Even LLM is now old story. So we are moving to LAMs. Uh, and then the focus on sustainability and the impact of carbon footprint. These, these are heavy algorithms. They take a lot of compute power. Uh, so I think we just need to keep our eyes open in this, uh, but I think, look, the IT industry in India can look at this as a glass half full or a glass half empty. I hope we look at it as a glass half uh, full, but we need to make some changes, you know, in how we design our value proposition, how we design our solutions, how we train our people, and I think we, we are in for another 10 years of that hockey stick growth, uh, or we'll be flat. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. So, I mean, um, I think it's important to realize, you know, we're in the middle of a lot of uh, impactful changes we're going to see happen. There's obviously some anxiety in the industry already. Uh, there's also a lot of energy. There's a lot of excitement. Um, but ultimately, you know, a, a services firm needs to be the first port of call uh, from clients to say, I need help with this. I need a partner who understands that. Gen AI, Gen AI ecosystem, who knows the Kahiris, the hugging faces, who understands Llama, these types of things. Now, our research has shown the impact on the US economy alone is going to exceed uh, two, two and a quarter trillion dollars um, over the next few years. Um, it's likely to replace a quarter of work tasks just in US and Europe, um, but that will also mean new jobs and a productivity boom because people are going to get more productive, there's going to be more 
um, of new jobs available to understand probability models, understand businesses are going to be slicker, they're going to move faster, they're going to grow faster. Um, and they need people to help them understand the context and be better communicators and better relationship people because that's becoming very, very important. Like, how imp who, who is seeing that their interpersonal skills is now very more important than ever in their jobs? Absolutely, the ability to engage with people, communicate with people, it's much more important than just being a content person. I'm just gonna crank out data all day long. No, I'm gonna communicate data all day long. That's what you need to do. So the skills that Sora pointed out are problem solving and adaptability. Um, define the problem, solve the problem, discuss the problem. And, and we need to be much better communicators and collaborators worldwide. You know, we're in a company with uh, uh, 60, 70 employees scattered around the world. But it's fantastic because we're online all day, we're talking to each other, we're talking to each other, we're communicating. That's how we keep growing and we keep, we keep exploiting the fact we can get talent in India, we can get talent in Spain, talent in Canada, places like that. So this quad factor of AI, automation, data platforms and analytics is key. These are the areas that are being invested in, being able to bring those together and understand what platforms enterprises are investing in, how to build those capabilities around them is where this is all shifting. Because um, ultimately, at the moment, enterprise clients are going to their partners and they're not saying, I'm gonna reduce my budget by 30% to keep delivering. Most of them are saying, I'm gonna still spend with you, but I want more for my money. I want more value for what I'm spending today. And that's the onus goes to the uh, service providers and the consultants and the tech firms is, how do you provide more value for what you're doing uh, without a tremendous amount of additional effort or linear growth? So I'll leave you with three, the three Ps of value creation. It's about prediction, it's about personalization, and then it's about productivity. But getting the prediction and the personalization right, winning the hearts of who you're working with is what's all important before you get into the productive benefits of where can we cut savings and drive efficiencies and these types of things. Great. So we have a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Have the, the lady of the third row. Thank you. Thank you, Phil and Saurabh. Um, I think my question is around, um, you know, one of the things that Saurabh, you pointed out about how, you know, we're still continuing to focus only on the CIO versus moving beyond in terms of technology buying. And I think it's obviously it's a lot more prevalent now because AI has sort of democratized that IT buying, right? Because unlike in the past where CIO had complete, you know, leadership and ownership of the IT budget for traditional charters like your cloud migration or data transformation or digital transformation. With AI, it's a little bit more, the deployment is more enterprise-wide, which means the CIO is now you know, having to collaborate a lot more with the C-suite and the other executives in the enterprise. So do you see that there is actually a, a, a budget allocation, or do you see that there is that spend or buying that's shifting outside of the CIO for this agenda? Uh, absolutely. It's been happening for some years. Uh, I think we, every, six months or 12 months, we reach out to about 500 or 600 enterprises um, and ask them, you know, how much of uh, technology spending is controlled by the CIO? And progressively, if you take a weighted average across these 500, 600 enterprises, that has gone down from 80 to nearly 55, 56 today. Uh, so about 46% of the technology spending is happening outside the CIO's total control. Uh, now, is the CIO happy about it? No. <laughs> um, Absolutely but, not, right? Yeah, but is it is it happening? Yes. Uh, the question for us as an IT services industry is how do you address that spend? Because it's not an easy spend to address. That 46% is distributed across so many different C-suites. You know, there's CMO, there's a CFO, there's a COO, there's a chief supply chain officer, now there's a chief sustainability officer. CHRO, I'm pretty sure you can think of many other C titles. Uh, so I think that's the challenge. 
Right. Thank you. And my second question is, do we get a copy of the deck? I don't think everyone got pictures of all the slides you were showcasing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Phil, Saurabh, thank you for this excellent presentation. As we learned this morning, engineering R&D sector is the fastest growing. And I'd love to understand from you, what do you feel about the impact of Gen AI, Gen AI on this particular sector? Uh, engineering R&D requires far more accuracy uh, because they are real products that have to work. Yeah, understanding design, it's incredibly valuable um, in terms of synthesizing experiences. Um, understanding um, how to integrate uh, technology with um, operational technology and machines. I bought a car recently, um, quite, a, quite a nice German car, and uh, for the first time ever, it wasn't how do I drive this thing, it's how do I learn how to use all the technology in the car. But um, I, I really think that um, the, you know, we're seeing a big adoption across engineering, supply chain, manufacturing. Um, you know, I came from a design technology background myself. How do you build and make things usable for people? And how do you get really smart about it? Because you want to synthesize multiple designs. You can do things way faster. You can design buildings. You can design automotive. You can do a hell of a lot. I think it's absolutely critical. And I think with, engin with um, digital engineers, um, a lot of the advanced ones who are getting their heads around probabilistic solutions, um, this the, the the sky's the limit with this. I think people who are just stuck in the old world of programming and coding, that is getting very, very commoditized. So understanding the design conceptual piece, the creative piece is, is exceptional. And then you've got the mid-level coders. I think you, many, many of those guys and gals can take the step up quite quite dramatically and then you've got the people at the top level who really get this stuff. Big earning potential, clients really need these skills and capabilities right now. And IT is now being used in a business context. So think of the opportunity uh, facing India and other nations here. If you think about half the spend is coming from marketing and supply chain and um, other, other parts of the business. It's how do you service these people with different skill set. So I think the challenge is on. I think India has proven very adept at figuring out what's the next big thing we need to learn and understand. Um, right now, I see a little bit of constriction. People are trying to choke it a little bit while you're trying to figure it out. But ultimately, I think there's a big opportunity to run this at scale, because this is all about data at scale, content at scale, engineering at scale, and fast and smart. Here. Hi. My name is Gautam. and. Um, I'm with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark, and we work with Indian companies, both products and IT services. And you, Saurabh, you mentioned that um, Indian IT services companies should look at going beyond CIO's organization for, and that is something I think product companies do a lot better, right? I think they are very product-specific question of <coughs> solutions that they have, and they do this very well. IT services have not really found a way to one, uh, engage with that audience. Two, also figure out and engage with ecosystems that you rightly mentioned that IT services companies should find a way to identify innovation clusters in various domains, engage with them actively, and see how they can use that for their customers. So do you have? An answer. It's it's more not a question, but more open for discussion on how they could do this better. Currently, we engage with quite a few IT services, and we have not seen. I can name one or two, but not enough IT services are engaging with innovation clusters, and there is definitely a gap that needs to be filled there. I, I think. I think we. Can you still hear me? By the way, yes. Um, I think we still are a little bit of a short-sighted, deal-focused uh, sort of a culture, uh, very salesy, is, you know, if you talk to anybody in the leading IT services industry, they're looking at, what are the deals that I have in my next quarter? You know, and all my tactics and all my strategy, actually strategy is basically tactics, right? We don't have, we don't have strategic functions uh, a lot, and we're looking at short-term deals versus what's the long-term value proposition. So I think 
that's the mindset that needs to be changed a little bit, you know, amongst the leadership, in my humble opinion. Uh, you need to have a little bit of a, you know, I, I don't know if you've read this book called The Infinite Mindset uh, by, by, by a professor in New York. Uh, his name was James Cars. Uh, he's a religious professor, so he's not a technology professor, and he was talking about, you know, games are finite and infinite, uh, and I think business is an infinite game, uh, and we treat it like a finite game, uh, and I think that's the mindset that sort of needs to change. Uh, it, it's it's still a young industry, but you know, 30 years is not the oldest industry, so maybe we'll get there. Yeah, I just need to add to this: um, is 25, 20, 30 years ago. Um, especially in India, a lot of you, a lot of the uh, everyone wanted to become software engineers so you could buy a car, get an apartment. Right? We, these were really big things to have. It's a bit like the American dream. I call it the Indian dream. Now, um, a lot of the young Gen Zs today, or Gen Zs, um, they're you know, they're, they're folks who already have the cars and the apartments, and they don't. They're not as motivated in the same way. They want impact. So the youngsters of today, they want to work for firms where they can make an impact and make a difference. They want to be more involved in helping clients make decisions, help clients design a car, design an internet-connected vacuum cleaner, you know, design, think, be more creative, have an impact, work with sustainability, that sort of thing. So I think that's where a lot of Gen AI comes in. It's creative solutions that are getting the younger generation excited again. And I think and if the services firms can embrace that and, and, and have an impact culture, then you're going to get the next wave of talent, and they're not all going to go running off to startups and tech firms and other, other businesses. Hey, uh, Phil, a quick, a bit of a wild question, actually. This morning, uh, the DeepMind CEO uh, in the morning session made one statement that uh, uh, we are moving towards a phase where each human will have an AI companion. And uh, maybe a few years from now, when you attend an interview, it will be you along with that companion. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just yeah. just curious to know your thoughts on... Do you take your rabbit with you say, hey, how well do you know me? No, it's, seriously, you have a well-trained AI companion, you're going to be a... Pretty effective, you're an effective human being. You'll be working, going into the workplace, and you're, you're able to use your access to knowledge and information and language models, action models, effects. I completely like that idea. I'm a fan of Mustafa. I think he's got some great ideas. So. Thanks. Hey, hi, this is Ninath Gotari from GK Infotech. Uh, just a quick question in terms of like, as uh, you know, we are talking about the Gen AI and, uh, you know, uh, so uh, looking at the unemployment perspectives, right? Because we see like the machine is going to take over the people and definitely the unemployment is going to increase and the, that will hamper the nation, uh, nation's development. So how are we looking at that particular, how are we trying, thinking to balance that particular ecosystem? Yeah. Well, I, I think I'll, I'll let Saurabh weigh in here, but, um, before Gen AI has even hit, uh, we have an employment slowdown anyway. You've seen the lack, you know, a lot of the IT firms aren't hiring freshers at the same rate. They're tending to go for very specific types. They're actually now reaching into universities and saying, can we start to do courses for students two years before graduation? Because companies want more plug and play employees. Uh, the onus is on the employee to become um, more self-trained, ready for the workplace. So I think we've already got an, a growing unemployment issue. And I, I actually think having um, emerging technology like this, which shows real value, can actually change the whole focus. Like, we want people with a probabilistic mindset, a heuristic mindset, who can work with business con contextual leaders, not just IT. So I, I do think this is all playing in. I don't think AI is going to be the thing that cost the jobs. I think natural economics is the thing right now which is hurting society and jobs, especially for the... I agree, but I think so we are seeing like people are laying off, right? I mean, Google or IBM, they have recently laid off so many people and that just a start, I, a tip of iceberg I see. Yeah. So how do we, you know, address this challenge in the future? I, 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 think, I think there is a... I think we'll have to feel some short-term pain to get long-term gain. So even if you look at... Um, even if you look at our IT services industry, uh, see the impact of that. You know, every every city now, practically in India, has an engineering college, right? 
uh, when I was growing up in India, that wasn't the case. There were like, what, five IITs? Now how many are there? 20? Three. Yeah, 23, see? Uh, and, and many other reputed colleges beyond IIT. So I think India has come such a long way in just the last 20 years in terms of IT education, in terms of STEM education in 20 years. Now, 20 years in the history is not that big. It's a, it's a pretty fast clip. I think what we'll need to do is add a A to that STEM, is make it STEAM, you know, arts, literature, problem solving, consulting. And if we can look at the next 20 years to focus on that STEAM education, uh, because that's something that we are not good at. As a Upscaling, country. I believe, is the... Uh, but it's, but it's going to have short-term pain, for sure. See, we in IT industry have seen this last 40 years continuous improvement in productivity through tools. Uh, I'm, I have punch card. Uh, I grew in punch card era. Yeah. But the point is, this improvement in 20 times for improvement productivity increase pro demand by 500 percent, 500 times, just making it up as a number. Because demand increase faster than productivity. Here is a tool which productivity improvement could be faster than the demand increase. What is the projection here? Because this seems to be a discontinuity in terms of productivity improvement. If we still think same equation will apply, then it is good for all of us in any case. That demand will anyway increase uh, faster than the productivity improvement. You know, So that equation is what what is not very clear here so i think i think it's the equation variables have changed uh, i think we've been our industry has grown with a linear equation of productivity and demand like you just mentioned but i think that it's a multivariate problem now <laughs> uh, you know if you take a take a mathematical thing then it's productivity it's sort of top line growth it's experience you know it's it's so many different angles to this um, that it's going to be hard to create a, a very simple sort of mathematical formula. It's going to be a, it's going to be a multivariate, uh, almost like a balanced scorecard that you'll have to create because I think the problem statement has changed. Uh, product, look how many, how much juice can you squeeze out of a lemon? At some point of time, that juice is going to dry up. Uh, we've not reached that stage, but at some point we will. So you then need to find out what's the other use of lemons, right? Use a lemon rind or something to, uh, to, to do with that. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. For more content on tech and leadership, subscribe to NASCOM YouTube channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update.